fairly old, I had a chance to uh, revisit some algorithmic aspects of uh, this uh, uh, element connectivity preserving reduction step recently. And uh, we could not do a whole lot, but uh, I thought there is an opportunity to engage uh, all these experts in maybe making more progress on some of those questions. So, uh, I will mainly focus the talk on uh, open problems that, uh, uh, that hopefully some of you would be interested in. So, let us get started. So, everyone is familiar, this is a connectivity workshop with uh, regular notions of edge connectivity and vertex connectivity. Uh, we will assume that the graph is simple for the most part. So, given two nodes, the edge connectivity is simply the maximum number of edge disjoint paths between S and T. And similarly, the node connectivity is the maximum number of internally known disjoint paths. And uh, uh, the global connectivity we will think of as a minimum over all pairs. And the, uh, many of you are familiar with maybe element connectivity. Uh, uh, some of you may not be. Uh, in, at least in this, the, the word element connectivity might be a uh, little bit different. So, in element connectivity, the graph is partitioned into uh, two sets. The terminals, which will be uh, in, in this talk, will be typically in black, and the non terminals, which are uh, the rest of the nodes. And the connectivity is only defined over the terminals. And given two nodes u and v, the two terminals u and v, the element connectivity between u and v is the maximum number of disjoint paths where the disjointness is over the edges and the non terminals. So, the elements of this graph are the edges and the non terminals. And given two terminals u and uh, v or u and w, the element connectivity between them is the maximum number of element disjoint paths. Uh, so, here is an example, uh, the element connectivity between uh, uh, u and v here is 4, because if you look at this purple path, um, this blue path, uh, the green path and the red path, you can see that uh, these two paths intersect at, uh, at the terminal node, that is that's ok, right. They have to be disjoint in everything else. One way to compute it is simply to put, uh, no, it is a node capacitated flow from u to v with infinite capacity on uh, every terminal and, and one on each edge and uh, uh, non terminal. Okay. Uh, it is easy to see that this notion generalizes edge connectivity. If all the nodes are terminals, then it reduces to edge connectivity. And if you have only two terminals, S and T, then the element connectivity is basically the same as the node connectivity, right. Okay. Uh, why is this interesting? Well, uh, at least you know, I, I, you know, uh, I, I spoke to Professor uh, Marder. He said that he considered it 40, 50 years ago, uh, maybe. In, uh, in, uh, but uh, this name, uh, in, in fact, uh, the oldest reference I can find, uh, Andres Frank sent me an email a uh, few years ago. They, they did consider this notion in uh, this paper on sparsification, uh, generalizing the sparsification result of Nagamochi and Ibaraki. Uh, but uh, from the computer science, theoretical computer science point of view, uh, the first reference I am aware of is in the network design work by Jain, Mandu, Vazirani and Williamson. And there has been a lot of work since then, because uh, element connectivity helps bridge results from edge connectivity and vertex connectivity, which tend to be harder. And there has been a separate work on packing uh, internally node disjoint stannatories, which will be the focus of the rest of this talk. And more recently, this, uh, uh, these notions have also helped uh, some results in uh, node capacity routing. So, th this has been a, a fruitful topic at least from an application point of view in addressing uh, node capacity problems. Um, so, uh, so, the rest of this talk will be about packing element disjoint standard trees and some as I said some algorithmic aspects that, uh, 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 that I looked at recently. And the goal as I said is to highlight some open problems. So, let us uh, go on to the packing problem. So, we already saw this a couple of times. Uh, uh, Menger's theorem gives us uh, a nice packing covering result, says the maximum number of edge or internally node disjoint ST paths is equal to the uh, cut. And a different result in this regard is uh, Nash Williams Stutt theorem on packing the maximum number of edge disjoint spanning trees in a graph or in a metroid, uh, by packing basis in a metroid. So, uh, in this talk, we will look at uh, something which is kind of uh, in between. So, 
we have a graph and we have a terminal set and we want to find, ask the question how many edge or internally no disjoint Steiner trees are there in this graph. Okay. And we will also consider a more general problem where I give you a, a collection of terminal sets T1, T2, TH and we ask how many internally no or edge or internally no disjoint Steiner forest in, in G are there. A Steiner forest is a, a connected subgraph which uh, connects each of these guys. So, T i is connected in that subgraph, T 2 is connected in the subgraph, T h is connected in the subgraph, right. Everybody is familiar with this notion. So, we are interested in packing edge disjoint or no disjoint standard trees in standard forest. So, this uh, this was the motivation for uh, Hind and Ehlerman, who I, I can't pronounce this uh, French name very well. Somebody has an uh, how do you pronounce this? Who's? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, H and H and O, I'll say. Uh, 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 so, so they they were interested in the generalizing Menger's theorem, which you, you can think of in the undirected case as in the node disjoint case. So we we know Menger's theorem says that the maximum number of node disjoint ST path, internally node disjoint ST paths, is equal to the ST node cut. What about if I want to pack internally node disjoint standard trees, right? Uh, so, that is their motivation. So, here is an example, the same example. So, I have three terminals and I want the maximum number of uh, node disjoint, internally node disjoint Steiner trees. So, here is I can take these two, this green and uh, uh, red, right. Those are two uh, things, but I can do better if I do something else, right. That it gives you two, here I can get three, okay, the, the blue, the green and the red. Okay, so you want to maximize this, right? Okay, so an upper bound for this turns out to be the element connectivity of the terminals in the graph. Why is that? Because if you have k trees, then e each tree you have a, for every pair you have a path which could use terminals, but they are internally not this way, right? So, so this is an upper bound. The question is, how close is this upper bound to the? to the right answer. I mean this is not, uh, this turns out to be not tight and uh, Hind and H and O, they considered uh, very special cases T equal to 3 and 4 and obtained some uh, tight results close to something like that. And uh, the first in, uh, the first uh, result here that I want to mention is that of Cherian and Salavatipur who showed that in any graph the number of element disjoint trees is at least k over log t. Here t is the number of terminals. And moreover, this is tight. There are examples where this is the right answer, right? modulo the constant. And in fact, the constant is actually very tight, 1 minus a little low of 1. And so the constant is actually very tight, okay. <coughs> so how did they do this, right? And uh, okay, so we, before I go on, um, uh, so in particular, they, they, and the more recent result by Azami, Cherian, and Jampani from, says that in planar graphs, you can get, I might be omitting a floor here, I will be a little bit uh, sloppy in some places. For planar graphs, you can get uh, k over 2 minus 1 uh, trees. So, planar graphs behave better and in more generally in, in a proper minor closed family of graphs, you can get some k over some constant which depends on the family, okay. So, uh, so that is the, the result and it is based on a theorem of uh, Frank, Kerali and Kriesel on packing spanning subgraphs in hypergraphs and I will come back to this. Okay, so these are uh, these are uh, nice results, and I want to mention how they got these results, right? Uh, I mean, a key step in, in proving these results is this uh, this graph simplification step, um, which is the 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 introduced in the H and O. Okay, it is uh, you know uh, hopefully all of us here are aware of uh, Marder splitting off theorem uh, for edge connectivity. And this is kind of like a similar reduction, not sim I mean in the same spirit it is a reduction step to help uh, reduce the problem for element connectivity. So what does it say? It says that for any edge PQ where P and Q are non-terminal, so if there is a graph, there, there is an edge between two non-terminals, you can either delete it or contract it without changing the global element connectivity of the terminals. One or the other. Yeah, one or the other, yeah, right. Uh, in some cases you can maybe do both and it is okay, right, right. So, this is the, the theorem. So, what, so let us look at this example. Uh, 
So, here the connectivity between u and v is 4, uh, u and w and uh, v and w is 3. Uh, if you take uh, any edge uh, connecting these two non-terminals, you can delete it in fact. Okay. It does not affect uh, the connectivity. And then if you look at this one, you can actually delete it as well. Once you delete it, uh, sorry, I can contract this, right? And it does not change the element, the global element connectivity. And, and then you can um, uh, contract that as well. So, this is, uh, this is what you get, right? Now, you can see that there are no edges between the non-terminals. But unfortunately, what happened in this is that this connectivity dropped to 3, right? So, I mean, uh, they did not care, but uh, in, in 2009, uh, along uh, with Nitish Korula, we showed that, in fact, not only does it preserve the, you can do the reduction to preserve all local element connectivities. For every pair, the element connectivity remains the same. It is not just the global element connectivity. Okay. And more recently, we gave a slightly different proof, which is uh, more on the uncrossing style. The point is that uh, uh, the proof is actually surprisingly simple. I, in fact, uh, you know, it's in, in a way, it's elementary. The, the, the arguments are not very difficult. Um, uh, I think uh, compared to the splitting off theorem for edge co connectivity, this is much simpler because the theorem statement is a little bit simpler. For every edge, this is true. So, in almost you have no choice. If it's true, it kind of follows uh, rather easily. Okay. Um, so, let us see what happens after you reduce this graph, right? Why is the reduction useful? What happens after you do the reduction, uh, you remove all, there are no more uh, uh, edges between uh, uh, any non-terminals. So, you start with the graph G and you end up with the graph H, right? And uh, all the connectivities are preserved. Now, because of the operations, the H is a minor of G. And now, what happens is H becomes a hypergraph, right? Because uh, you can view it as a hypergraph because every node is just connected to the a hypergraph on the terminals, because every node is just connected to the terminal. There are no edges. So, it is a bipartite graph. Uh, as I mean, sorry, if you, uh, if you assume that there are no edges between the uh, terminals, which you can put a subdivide with a, a white node and make it other side, it becomes a clean hypergraph, right? Any question? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, then, uh, then the connectivity in the hypergraph is just the hypergraph cut and moreover, it is a symmetric submodular function on the terminals, right, the connectivity, is, right, and so it admits a gomery hood tree. The connectivity admits a gomery hood tree because it is a symmetric submodular function, right, and uh, all basic facts. So, so why was this connection useful, right, you know, so why, why was this reduction step useful? Yeah. Oh, because after you reduce, basically it looks like this. So, you can, uh, it is a bipartite graph, right? There are no edges between these guys. So, each of this is a, you can think of it as a hyper edge connecting the, this one, this connects these three, that connects these three, right? So, bipartite graph, so why are like hyper edges and uh, over the, uh, okay. Uh, Okay, so why was this useful? The what happened is that when we wanted to pack element disjoint standard trees, we reduced it to the, if you, while preserving the connectivity, we reduced it to this problem, how many hyper edge disjoint connected graphs are there in H, right? After the reduction, we just are packing uh, in this hyper graph. Now. So, how many are there? And, uh, and here is the Cherry and Salvatipur algorithm. For, once you reduce for a hyper graph, they just, do a random coloring from using, a, take each hyper edge and give it a color from 1 to C k over log number of terminals, okay. So, this, this is the algorithm to pack, okay. So, they randomly color using this many colors, okay. And then the claim that each color class is uh, connected with some constant probability. You can say something stronger, but just for, for our purposes. Each color class will be a uh, connected uh, hypergraph with constant probability. A K is the global connective, the, the min connectivity between uh, uh, any two terminals. So, the, the hypergraph connectivity of this, okay. So, this is the algorithm, right. And so, in expectation, we get a K over log T trees, 
right? If each of them is a color class is a thing and it is more or less tight you can make it, right? Okay. So, okay. Uh, I want to connect it to uh, packing uh, the, the Nash Williams start theorem and and uh, this result of Frank Kirelli Kriesel. So, if, if you have a if you have a graphs or uh, matroids, uh, more generally, if you have a matroid which has a rank function r, then the maximum number of disjoint bases uh, we know the formula for it, right? From Tutt Nash Williams theorem, it is the min over all subsets of the ground set, the cardinal of e minus s by rank e minus rank n, right. And Frank Kirill and Kriesel generalized this graph version to hypergraphs via partition connectivity. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not giving us a, 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 a this uh, result, but we will we'll come back to that. So, I, I wanted to say something about uh, polymetroids here. One can view the problem of packing connected hypergraphs as uh, packing basis of a polymetroid, right? In fact, Gruyer was the one who initiated this work with uh, me many years ago. Uh, so, if what is a polymetroid? Uh, 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 here we'll think of it as a monotone integer valued submodular function, right? For our purposes. And we'll call a subset of the ground set a base if it is full rank, right? Okay. And uh, you can also ask how many in a polymetroid. You can ask how many bases can you pack, right? So and uh, the similar formula gives you an upper bound, right? But you have to be a little bit careful. You have f e minus f s that is a little bit. Uh, it's not. Uh, you look at this term. It's not very hard to convince yourself that this is an upper bound on the number of bases in a polymetroid. So then you can ask, you know, can you pack bases in a polymetroid? And this is precisely what we showed uh, to partly generalize the previous result that in any polymetroid there are k over log f e disjoint bases, and this is tight again modulo constant. A base is simply any subset which I mean I'm, I'm abusing terminology. Yeah, base. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean bases don't have a good behavior in uh, polymetroids, right? So in in in, in this setting. So, uh, you can make it minimal, yeah, we, we can make it minimal, but uh, you can always take it out, right? So, so you can say a minimal set which satisfies this, right? But it does not have nice properties, so we do not pay attention anyway, right? Okay. So, you can uh, in a polymetroid there are this many bases and uh, the algorithm is exactly the same. What we showed was that you take uh, each element in the ground set and color it with this many colors, you will show that each color class is uh, has a base with constant probability. Okay. So, you, you get uh, this, uh, this thing. Okay. Okay. My first open problem. Uh, so, for any polymetroid there are k over log f e disjoint bases, right. Uh, the open problem is can you replace the log f e by log max e f e. That is if each element of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, if the value of the submodular function at uh, each element is small, that is each element does not contribute a lot, right. If you think of matroids, each element increases the rank by 1. And so that is very nice because then you can pack very well, right, exactly. While if uh, each element can create a lot of rank, add a lot to the rank, then it is not so nice. You in encode set cover, domatic partition, lots of interesting, uh, more complicated problems, and that is why you lose a lot here. So, what if I have uh, this, this is small, I want to get a much finer result, right? Uh, it is a technical problem. And why is it even possible to conjecture? It is possible to do fractional packing with this k over this quantity, log of this quantity using a, a nice classical result of Lorentz for the submodular set cover. So, it is fractionally you can pack this many, question is integrally can you pack that. <coughs> we were talking about packing uh, hyper graphs. Yeah. Which, which uh, ah, so, it is a special case of this because if you look at the hyper edges as a ground set, then define the function which is how many connected components are there, the, ra the total number of terminals minus how many connected components are there. It is a function, this is a 
polymer right just like in graphs you can view that as a how many the same rank function work sorry yeah I, I switched without saying why I am interested in this more general form ok yes any questions for that yeah ok uh, uh, so now let me uh, so that that is the reason why the reduction step was useful right the reduction step helped simplify this complicated looking graph to a hypergraph and then we could do something very simple the, uh, we do not know a, a more uh, a simple way of doing packing without doing this reduction step. So, that is at least one of the motivations, but let us now quickly talk about edge disjoint pa packing this is a long history for this uh, and uh, there are people here who are very interested in that. Uh, um, Matthias Kriesel uh, somewhere here uh, uh, conjectured that in the edge connected case if uh, the terminal set is 2k edge connected in a graph then there are k edge disjoint standard trees right. And Lau proved that it is uh, with the 24k edge connected and this has been improved I, I did not know about this paper I was doing some uh, search and found out a recent improvement of there is a I, when I, I, I when I went first went to Urbana I gave it as an open problem and uh, hey, who, who a student of Doug West got interested and in they improved it to 6.5 and more recently they, I, I have not looked at this paper uh, this, this is 5k plus 4 is the current best found. And I want to make a comment here that some of these tec these techniques use uh, first as a first step uh, a Marder's edge connectivity reduction and then do uh, a lot of things after that. For planar graphs, it does not seem like uh, at least you know not that I am familiar with it, these techniques uh, based on edge connectivity do not seem to help all that much or maybe no, no one has studied, but what is interesting is that for planar graphs you can get 2k plus 2 connectivity is sufficient via the element connectivity result. And uh, there is something a little uh, uh, the, the, the element connectivity reduction step preserves minors while the splitting off is not uh, minor preserving uh, at least on the face of it uh, that I can see. So, uh, you can get a almost tight result in planar graphs via some uh, via the, uh, via the more general problem of packing element disjoint standard trees. So, that is just a comment to say that this connect element connectivity has seems very interesting in that way. So, now I want to switch uh, to some other problem uh, which is more general than standard trees which is to pack standard forest because there are some nice open problems here. W what is with packing standard forest? My terminal set is now has different different groups say this blue guys and this uh, this uh, um, black guys let us assume they are disjoint for simplicity and I want to pack standard forest now and I want to connect the as many standard forest connects each of these groups I want to pack standard forest. So, here is an example this green guy connects the green set of uh, edges connects uh, um, the terminals, but these terminals do not have to be connected to this black terminals and but in this red one all of them are connected uh, and, and we can ask how many edge disjoint or internally no disjoint standard trees can you pack ok. Uh, and it turns out and that is one of the reasons we actually did this global element connectivity product uh, this local element connectivity reduction step. So, here is what we could prove that if each T i is k element connected then there are k over log t log h element disjoint standard forest. So, we are losing an extra log h factor which we do not think is necessary. So, this is very similar to the case when uh, the number of groups is 1 right. So, this should be h plus 1 just to be technical. Uh, so, we are losing an extra log h factor and in planar graphs you can pack k over 5 minus 1 disjoint standard forest and in bounded genome graphs we can get again uh, something, but our technique is a little different from uh, Azami, Cherian and Zampani and does not rely on uh, this result. So, because of that we are not able to get it for the minor free graphs. So, uh, and, and for the edge disjoint case Lau extended his result to prove that k over 32 edge disjoint standard forest can be packed if each t i is k element connected. In fact, his paper only gives k over 54, but he said a much more complicated thing can do k over 32, but just he did not publish it uh, at least as far as I can see. Maybe it is in his thesis I did not see. Uh, 
So here is some uh, bunch of open problems that I, 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 I hope uh, some of you will get interested. The, the main one I would like to see solved is this one, that how many Steiner forests can you pack? We can get k over log t log h, but I, we conjecture it is k over log t and fractionally you can pack k over log t. And uh, for minor closed families, we don't know, our techniques for planar graphs don't extend and I, we conjecture that you can pack k, k over some constant. And why is it interesting? They are ki kind of related to, in the fractional setting, you can pack uh, these this results uh, we conjecture are uh, tight because these correspond to integrality gaps of the node weighted Steiner tree and Steiner forest problem. So if, if we know that we can do that many in fractionally, so can we do it integrally? And, and uh, that is, uh, that is uh, and in fact, the results for node weighted standard tree and standard forest in minor free graphs were given by Demain, Hajigai, and Klein. And this suggests that, you know, this, this should be, uh, you know, the, here it should be k and here it should be k over log t. And obviously, the, uh, these are all open problems. So for standard trees, Kreese's conjecture is still open, right. Uh, for standard forests, uh, also there is a no worse bound than k over 2 is known. Uh, even in planar graphs, uh, we don't have a tight bound. So I'm hoping that uh, some of you will revisit this question uh, and, and uh, close some of these gaps. Uh, okay. Uh, so I want to, uh, I'll, I'll skip this uh, special uh, Special case, it's technical, I'll, I'll come back to it uh, in the afternoon if people are, want to uh, work on some, some of these problems. So I want to look a little bit about uh, some of the recent work on algorithmic aspects of element connectivity, right. So I, I give you this graph where G is uh, undirected, it has n vertices and m edges and the number of terminals is t. So we can ask, you know, how given S and T, two terminals, how fast can you compute their element connectivity? Okay, how fast can you compute uh, the global element connectivity, that is the min overall pair, right? And what about all pair element connectivity, right? And can you get this graph H, reduct, can you reduce the graph to this hypergraph quickly? Because we are using that in the packing, right? So can you do that uh, quickly? So this joint work with uh, some uh, students at uh, Urbana. Uh, he actually was an undergrad and he's a PhD student. Um, so these are the things that we wanted to study. And these problems lie somewhere between edge connectivity and vertex connectivity. And I think they are, uh, uh, algorithmic questions are quite interesting. So we were able to do something very simple and, and I hope some of you can uh, can help uh, make progress on this. So how about, you know, if I give you a graph and I ask you how fast can you compute the element connectivity, right, between two given nodes? Well, you know, as we said, you know, there are two ways of doing it. One is that you put uh, node capacities on this, right, uh, infinite node capacities on every terminal and uh, then it's just node design, uh, node capacity flow from U to V. But in fact, you can, uh, you can reduce it to unit capacity flow, ST flow in a directed graph. If you do the obvious reduction, because every edge has also unit capacity, if you do the obvious gra reduction to directed graphs, you just want to compute unit capacity flow in a directed graph. You can reduce it to that, right? So you, we can use the max flow in unit capacity directed graphs, and there's been a lot of progress in, uh, amazing progress in recent years. So the best results that I know of are these two, Madri gave uh, this, this notation because of PowerPoint, this means I'm suppressing log factors. Okay, <laughs> you know, it's O tilde, but I couldn't write O tilde without killing myself. So I said, okay, I'll just use this notation. I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the mathematicians might <laughs> be unhappy, but it's just there. For this talk, this just means O tilde, I'm suppressing log factors, okay. Uh, so th this is the running time for uh, unit capacity max flow in directed graph. So one pair, you can do this, right, okay. So what about uh, all pairs? Suppose I want to find out the all pair uh, connectivity, element connectivity, right? Here is some, that, that, that is where some nice structure. If you want to compute vertex connectivity, 
then things are not so nice because there there can be many there can be many entries to different values, right? While here, because of the as we saw that uh, the, uh, this is uh, basically a satisfies triangle inequality and and so there are only yeah there is a gomery hood tree because it is symmetric it is induced by a symmetric submodular function yeah No, I mean, you, know, you can compute all pair connectivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't say what the run. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll come to that. Right? Yeah, right. You know. Um, yeah, it's, it's faster. It's not faster. Uh, it is only in the Oracle model. Right? Okay. So if you do the Oracle model, it is n cube calls to the function, but each call would take you. But this is faster. If you just do the plain Gomery hood reconstruction, it is faster. Okay. Right. okay. So, so we saw already that uh, the connectivity, element connectivity is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, well behaved like edge connectivity. It has a Gomery hood tree and so we might as well compute the Gomery hood tree, right? I mean, I am, you know, it is uh, it's not hard to compute a Gomery hood tree just by using uh, T minus 1 single pair computation. I am not doing anything clever here. But that that's all I know, right? How do you come? Given I, I want to compute the all pair connectivity in a, in a in a in a in a element connectivity in a graph, you just compute the Gomery hood tree, okay? And how many max flow computations? It is the number of terminals times the max flow, okay? Now you will say, okay, what can you do in the edge connectivity case? So, anyone know what is the best uh, time to compute uh, the Gomery hood tree in, uh, in, uh, for edge connectivity, simple graph? You can do it in nm time. You do not have to do, it is very fast, it is a very nice result that uh, of, of uh, uh, this was a few years ago in stock, Panigrahi, uh, Hariharan, right? So, you can compute the Gomery hood tree of an uncapacitor graph in nm time, which is quite nice. It's, it is much, it is faster than uh, computing it uh, in this way. It is a very, very pretty result. It is a random capacity. No, uh, unit capacity only. Uh, yeah, unit capacity only. Yeah, so this is the limitation is that it is, uh, but still, you know, <laughs> it is still, I am here interested only in unit capacity. It does not help me much, right? I do not know how to do it. So that is a very nice problem. Can you beat this running time, right? Uh, so it is. You know, th we have this uh, Karen's result on computing uh, Gomery hood tree for symmetric submodular functions, but that's kind of in the Oracle model. Here is a very concrete, nice problem defined by an implicit graph. So I think it's interesting to see how much we can push algorithmic techniques for this concrete problem as opposed to working in the Oracle model. So there's this nice, uh, nice question. I think. Okay. The sad story is that we don't know how to compute the global element connectivity any faster than computing all pair connectivity. Okay, so so I, I I give you a the 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 graph and I say I want to find the minimum element connectivity over all pairs, right? I don't know how to do it any faster than computing the Gomery hood tree and then taking the minimum, right? So so I mean not that you know that doesn't mean there is not a clever algorithm, but I think that's an incentive for some of you to look at this. So what is so I, I, you know what what is interesting here? Let, let's look at some special cases, right? What if I gave you a hypergraph, right? Recall a hypergraph is a special case of our of our problem because eventually we get to a hypergraph, right? So if I give you a hypergraph and say compute for me the global element global uh, hypergraph connectivity, how fast can you do it? And if you use the not flows but the the the, the algorithm the Nagamochi Ibaraki's uh, style algorithm. You can get nm time, where what is m here? M is the the representation of the hypergraph as a bipartite graph. M is the number of edges in that representation. Okay, m is not the number of hyperedges because the hyperedge can have many connections, right? So the right size to think of a hypergraph is look at the bipartite graph representation and look at the number of edges, right? And if you look at that, the running time of uh, the the algorithm that comes out of uh, uh, Nagamochi and Ibaraki's uh, style thing is nm. Okay, so we don't know anything better than that. Okay, so that's an uh, interesting problem. Can you find uh, for element connectivity at least nm time? Our algorithm for 
global element connectivity is now taking, if the number of terminals is n, we are doing n times the max flow. This is worse than nm, right. So, for element connectivity, can we do better than uh, what they are computing everything, right. So, so I think that is a nice problem. Um, and now, let me say a few things about uh, what we do for reduction. That is, I give you this element a graph, and I want to go back to that hypergraph by doing repeated uh, reduction steps, right? Okay. Uh, how fast can we do that, right? We, we were interested in figuring out a fast algorithm for going from the given graph to the hypergraph. And well, here is the first naive algorithm, right? Uh, we know the theorem, so we say for every edge between non-terminals, if there is an edge between non-terminals, take it out, compute all the connectivities, contract it, compute all the connectivities, and then check if everything is okay, and then whichever is okay, you do that, right? Okay, fine, <laughs> right? You know, that's not very good. How long does it take? You know, it takes m times t times, uh, uh, you know, okay. So that's 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 clearly not the best thing you can do. So here is one uh, a little less naive algorithm, right? We said, okay, what are we doing, right? If you remove an edge or contract an edge, the connectivity doesn't drop by more than one, right? Because it's a node capacity thing, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So the first you know thing is like first, okay, we also have some structure. So first we compute the Gomery hood tree. Okay, one time we compute the Gomery hood tree, all pair connectivity. At the beginning we need to know what is going on, right? So we compute the Gomery hood tree. And then for each edge of the Gomery hood tree, we maintain the flow that achieves that connectivity. Okay, we actually compute the flow and store the flow. Okay, yeah. Okay, now we do the same naive thing. We'll try look at an edge and we say, okay, I'll remove it and recompute the flows. But remember, I, I, I only have to, I, my flow will only change by one when I remove an edge or contract an edge, right? So I can just augment, I can do the residual graph and just check whether I can find a new path to see if that, that flow can, I can increase it again. That's fast, right? Because the flow is changing only by one value, right? Okay. So that's all we do, but we only do it for the edges of the Gomery hood tree, and if you preserve all of them, it's okay. The structure it will preserve everything. It's a very naive, simple observation, but we are doing some very simple things here, right? So what are we doing? We just maintain the Gomery hood tree and the flows for each edge of the Gomery hood tree, and we do the same naive thing. When we remove an edge or contract an edge, recompute the flows, and if everything is okay, we know it is safe, and then we move on, right? So this is one line, right? So the running time becomes t times the max flow for the original computation plus t m square, okay, because in each step, okay, it's not, that, that's, I just don't worry about the precise running time, this is the basic idea, <laughs> right. And we do have one more uh, idea, that's all uh, we had, right, one more idea to make it a little better. Instead of, so we could have picked any edge we wanted, right, you know, we are not being very clever of how we picked edges, right. So there are m edges, so in principle in the old, the previous algorithm will take m times whatever thing we do. Can we make it n times because, you know, contracting a vertex is better than, uh, than working with edges. Let's not be careless about how we pick the edges. Let's be a little bit more careful. So here is uh, one idea. You fix any non-terminal no node P which has at least one edge to some other non-terminal. Otherwise, we are done with that node, right, because it's already reduced. So if a node is, uh, has a non-terminal node has, uh, let's look at a picture. So suppose it's a non-terminal node and he has some edges to uh, non-terminals and some edges to terminals. I want to know, can I throw out P or if I cannot throw out P, what does it mean? That means one of the edges incident to P can be contracted, should be contracted, okay. But that's easy because how do I check whether a, a node P can be thrown out? I throw out all these edges, or I basically throw out P and I do the same computation as before. Again, the flow doesn't change by more than one because it's a node capacitor flow, remember? So I can do the step. So it is easy to check whether a node P can be deleted or not, okay? Now I also want to do, if the node P cannot be deleted, I want to find an edge which can be contracted that is incident to P quickly, okay? You can do something clever, but a simple way is to do binary search on the edges here, okay? So you, you just throw out half these edges and check, is it safe? If it is not, I know there is some edge here which is, uh, and you do some bi simple binary search, and essentially you can re reduce the running time 
of m here to n and so the running time you get is the original time to compute the gomery hood tree plus t times n m okay that's it that's all we had okay uh, very simple ideas but we don't know what to do more than that right so so um, uh, so that, so let me leave you with uh, the table of uh, uh, what is known for computing edge and uh, vertex connectivity in uh, simple graphs. Let's not worry about capacities. So if you want uh, ST flows, the max flow times are pretty good now, but you can do something clever for uh, undirected graphs. So the, the uh, I'll have one more thing to say about approximations. So I'll, I'm an approximation guy. I have to say something about approximations, right? Uh, so the interesting thing is this, for the global minimum cut in a graph, we know a linear time algorithm, right? And uh, Ken will talk to us tomorrow. And for node capacitated graphs too, there is a very nice algorithm, NM time algorithm for all pair uh, global connectivity, vertex connectivity. It's a very nice algorithm of uh, Hensinger, Rao et al. from uh, many years ago. The thing is, you know, element connectivity is related to this, but it's not quite because of this infinite capacities. We can't reduce it to this. We tried to use some of these ideas to get an NM time algorithm, but we didn't succeed. So that's another interesting problem. Can you even get NM time algorithm to find all pair uh, element connectivity and through that uh, global element connectivity? So in fact, global element connectivity maybe is much faster. And and I'll, 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 and, and of course, improving the reduction step running time from TNM to something better would be great too, right? Okay, uh, uh, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about approximation, right? This is something that uh, I find is interesting. So uh, many of you know that there have been a lot of breakthroughs in recent years on uh, fast algorithms for max flow, right? Uh, those are exact algorithms, but for example, in undirected uh, edge capacitated graphs, there's a near linear time algorithm that will give you one minus epsilon approximation to the max flow between S and T. This works only for undirected edge capacitated graphs. So what is one consequence of this, right? So I give you a graph and I give you S and T and I want to say, quickly give me an estimate of the number of disjoint paths between S and T, right? I don't want to know whether it is, uh, what is precisely, you know, the right number, right? If it is, I want an estimate quickly, right? You can use this algorithm in linear time to get a quick one minus epsilon approximation to the edge connectivity between S and T, right? So can we do anything like that for vertex connectivity? That is, I give you S and T in an undirected graph, and I say, give me a quick estimate of the number of uh, disjoint paths between S and T. Is there a linear time algorithm or a near linear time algorithm for that, right? So, so connected to this packing I talked about, suppose I give you a hypergraph, right? And I ask you, give me a fast algorithm to find the global min cut of a hypergraph, right? The exact algorithm as we saw takes NM, as I mentioned, takes NM time currently. But improving that is already interesting. But here is an easy result that comes out of the packing algorithm that I mentioned, the randomized packing algorithm. You just do this the random, uh, by doing binary search, you can get a one over log n approximation to the min cut of a hypergraph in randomized linear time, near linear time. Just as a consequence of the packing result I talked about earlier. Right, you, you randomly color it using uh, K colors, and you can check if each of them creates a spanning thing. If you do, then I know that there are, the connectivity is at least K over log N, right, for given K. So one can get a very fast log, one over log N approximation to the global min cut of hypergraph using the packing result I mentioned earlier. Can you do better? Can you get a constant factor approximation in near linear time, right? Right, or, or any, I mean, maybe better than that, right? And so I think thinking about slightly about uh, loose versions of these problems uh, is interesting and has uh, to, to see if we can make progress on the exact algorithms as well. Okay. I, I'll, I'll stop there.
uh, no, the, the, the sort of we stay away from director of brass, they do not behave very well <laughs> for most of the time. Or, or maybe they, the, the, the. I, I did not think about uh, director graphs. Uh, so, 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 uh, in, in a way, in, in director graphs, the node versus edge is not so important, right? The, the element connectivity is interesting because it, it, it is going towards the node capa node problem. While uh, in undirected graphs, it makes sense to distinguish edge capacities and node capacities because they do not behave the same. So, one is harder than the other typically. Uh, while in directed graphs, that distinction is not very useful to a large extent. So, uh, it is less, uh, I think, you know, at, uh, without uh, thinking much, right? Uh, you know, that is that. So, I think there is one interesting question, I am sure that is to ask that uh, there is a 